thought I'd revisit one of the OG Storytime videos from like five or six years ago because, let's be honest, those videos are of very mediocre quality and, well, I can do better. Plus, more information becomes available over time, so I thought I'll get that in, sort of bring everything up to a more standardized format, the sort of format that you're used to now, and we'll go from there, really. And one of the core elements of this Storytime series, and yes, it is still Storytime, it's just in a more modern package these days, the back of the back of the grid teams are the ones that keep turning up, as well as the controversial stuff and the technological stuff. And I brushed upon all of this in the Team Minus video from a few days ago, or last week, whenever it was. The plucky little upstarts that had to do whatever they could do to survive, even if it meant teaming up with potential backers who weren't all they said they were, or were part of a massive European or American fraud organisation in some cases. Arrows, Forty, Onyx, all dealt with somebody who turned out to be a little bit iffy. But the one that crops up time and time again, and the one that's the big surprise because of how they went about doing the funding, was Lola. Lola is a name you might have heard of. It's okay if you haven't, because I'm here to fill you in. Lola, from the 50s up until the 90s, was one of the people to go to if you wanted a car building. They were a bit like how Delara is now, and we'll get to all of that later on in the video. And Lola and Delara both had some sort of F1 endeavour in the past that... Well, didn't necessarily go anywhere. Lola's bread and butter prior to the mid-90s was building chassis for junior formula categories, F3 and F3000 mainly. F3000 is what is now F2 or GP2 if you're of a certain vintage like myself. But they weren't the only ones, because Reynard was also involved, as were Rolt and other manufacturers and Lola had also built chassis for the kart series on the other side of the Atlantic. And because you had multiple manufacturers involved, particularly in the European junior categories, you had what I like to call the online racing effect. Allow me to explain. When a new car is released for any of these racing games, whether it's iRacing, R-Factor 2, ACC, whatever it may be, that new car is usually overpowered and they've not bothered to do much of a BOP yet. It's probably to make people buy it because people just want to be competitive. This is the same thing that happened here. If Lola had the best chassis in 1990, everybody that could afford to switch would have a Lola for 1991. Then in 1992, Reynard might have the best one, so for 1993, everybody's got a Reynard. And it starts flipping and flopping because everybody's buying whatever the best car at that particular time is to make sure they're competitive. Lola was also one of the three companies approached by Ford to help with building the GT40, the Ferrari killer that they had at Le Mans between 1966 and 1969. It was Lotus, Cooper and Lola if I remember rightly, and basically what happened was they picked Lola because Cooper was about to go bust, and Lotus wasn't going to do it because Colin Chapman wanted the thing to be branded as a Lotus. Plus Colin was also stretched thin with Formula 1 and IndyCar anyway, so he couldn't really take on this third project, so they went to Lola. It's why the Ford GT40 and the Lola T70 look quite similar. Well, the prototype of the GT40 anyway. But Lola's time in Formula 1 had started in 1962, supplying the Lola Mark IV to Reg Parnell's Bowmaker Yeoman team, which, as it so happens, was the first time that a team in Formula 1 had a commercial agreement with a company over naming rights, a full six years before Chapman put gold leaf logos all over his Lotus 49s. That team also had close ties with BRM and from 1963 onwards ran BRM engines with Lotus chassis. It was at that point in Formula 1 where the likes of Lotus, Cooper and so on would sell other teams' cars and engines, and those cars would be down as something like Lotus BRM rather than Reg Parnell Racing. So to put it into modern language, imagine Haas being down as Dallara Ferrari. Either way, that Lola Mark IV that turned up in 1962 was good straight off the bat, because at the first round at Zandvoort, John Surtees took pole. But he and his teammate Roy Salvadori, who is British, not Italian for some reason, retired. Salvadori would retire from every race that season, while Surtees scored points at every race he finished. Lola would spend two seasons in Formula 1 before withdrawing for a bit, so they could concentrate on the sports cars. In 1967, the so-called Hondola turned up, as Lola had built the chassis for the Honda team, which, funnily enough, would be driven by John Surtees. Lola was asked to build the car because Honda had built one in Japan that was too heavy, and they needed to call on someone with experience to get the car done, and done quickly. So Lola took a T90 car that had run at the Indy 500 to get things sorted, and the car would win the 1967 Italian Grand Prix. In the 1970s, Graham Hill called on Lola to build the cars for his fledgling Formula 1 team, the Embassy Graham Hill team, and Graham Hill had actually won the Indy 500 in a Lola. 
So Lola built the GH1 for the team and it went through the 1975 season, but they also had the GH2, but this went unraced because the team ceased to exist after Graham Hill and several high-profile team members were killed in a plane crash in the November of 1975. After doing some work for Haas in the 1980s, which isn't connected to the Haas currently in Formula 1, Lola built the chassis for the LaRue's team at the start of the 90s, which was at a time when the team seemed to be involved in all sorts of scandals. The first being when Gerard LaRue's business partner, Didier Kalmels, was sent to prison for murdering his wife, after he caught her shagging somebody that wasn't Didier Kalmels. And then, at the end of the season, the team was stripped of all of its constructors' points because the team had registered the car as its own name, rather than as a Lola. This was just one of those things, it was all a big misunderstanding, just a simple admin error. This caused a massive stir because it promoted the well-connected Ligier team, well-connected in terms of politics, up a position, and it put them into a position where they could inherit all of the subsidies and prize monies. The other time in the 1990s that Lola had a presence was building the cars for the Scuderia Italia team. This team had already used Delara chassis to very little effect, and they were the only team in the 1993 season not running some sort of driver assistance, so that being auto gearboxes, traction control, active suspension, anti-lock brakes, all the stuff that the likes of Williams and McLaren had. The Delara chassis was crap, and the Lola one wasn't much better. The team found it difficult to just qualify for races. Initially, in the 1993 season, only 24 of the 26 cars could actually qualify for a Grand Prix. At the second round at Interlagos, the teams unanimously voted to up it to 25, this being so that every team could have at least one car on the grid. Somehow though, Lola, BMS, Scuderia Italia, whatever you want to call them, managed to finish above Tyrrell, despite not turning up for the final two rounds of the season and not qualifying for seven rounds either. This was all because Luca Badoa survived the San Marino Grand Prix and finished 7th, where it was a race of very high attrition. It was also in 1993 that Lola achieved what was its crowning glory, at least I reckon so, because a Lola chassis driven by Nigel Mansell had won the kart title, making him the first and so far only person to hold the kart and F1 titles at the same time. And that's because when the kart season finished, Prost hadn't won 1993 yet. Lola was also supplying the chassis exclusively for Indy Lights. At some point in the early 1990s, Eric Broadley, who was the founder of the Lola Car Company, decided he wanted to be in Formula 1 in his own right, not building cars for other people, but building cars for himself, a fully-fledged Formula 1 operation as his own constructor. So basically do what Williams, Benetton, McLaren and Ligier were doing, and just get on the grid and be a Formula 1 team, basically. Alan McNish briefly tested a prototype through 1994 and 1995, I found a drawing I can use to give you an idea as to what he was working with. The thing didn't even have an airbox. I'm not sure what was going on here. Maybe they thought it would be more aerodynamic this way? I mean, it's kind of like a kart car mixed with an F1 car because the kart cars of that time had very low engine covers. It's probably because of that. In my mind. The problems for Lola, though, were starting to mount up. Broadly was spreading himself far too thin, and while they had just won the title with Nigel Mansell, everything was starting to go to pot. Bowmaker back in 1962 had bailed Broadly out because the company was starting to struggle and they were his saving grace. At the same time, he'd fallen out with Carl Haas and had also tried to get a composite company off the ground, but that had failed, which might have cost him a lot of money. He was also carrying an undiagnosed heart condition, so by the time 1996 rolled around, he needed to find a way of making some more money. He actually had a few choices. He could either sell the company and jack it all in and have it carry on under new ownership, he could build a road legal sports car, or he could go into Formula 1. It's the last one that he did because of the, you know, the already mentioned prototype during 1994 and 1995. Broadly actually had something working in his favour with entering Formula 1. The regulations were set to change for 1998, which involved some key changes to the cars. But nothing as radical as the changes between, say, 2021 and 2022, or 2016 and 2017. Narrower tracks, grooved tyres, other changes to the aero, all part of another Max Mosley knee-jerk reaction to safety. Okay, let me backtrack a second here, because that makes it sound like I'm slamming Max for those changes. But when you look into it, at the 1997 Australian Grand Prix, Villeneuve had gone three and a half seconds faster than he'd gone the previous year. The tyres had become so grippy thanks to the tyre war between Goodyear and Bridgestone that drivers were braking harder and later than they'd ever done before, so changes were made to try and slow down the development of the cars. It would make way more sense to come in in the first year of a new set of regulations than it would be to come in at the end of the previous ones. 
You spend all that money to get into Formula One, only to have to spend more money to get the new regulations ready 12 months later. Come in at the start of the new regulations, and you're not having to spend massive amounts twice. Just the once. You see where I'm coming from with that, right? I mean, yes, Stewart had come in for 1997 as well, but this was Ford's factory team. It didn't matter if they were rubbish. Use it as a learning process and work on a 1998 car at the same time. Unfortunately though, Mastercard, the title sponsors of the Lola team, said, No, you're coming in in 1997, not 1998. So the car was rushed through, literally put together a few weeks prior to arriving in Australia. Stewart, by comparison, had announced their project before the start of 1996, and, as mentioned, had Ford money behind it. By the time Lola turned up at the Australian Grand Prix, that car had not once seen the inside of a wind tunnel. This was made a worse statement of fact when you consider that this is supposed to be one of the world's best customer car manufacturers, so they had no idea of how bad it was going to be until it was actually on track, because it had barely done any testing. They'd actually tested it at Silverstone, but the car burst into flames. The car was bloody awful. It had the aerodynamic properties of John Prescott, and instead of the planned in-house V10, they had to make do with the Ford ECA ZTEC RV8, which is the engine that Sauber used exclusively through the 1995 season. And that engine in itself was a slightly smaller version of the engine that Schumacher's Benetton had in 1994. So the engine was two, maybe three years out of date, and underpowered as well. Senna, Hamilton, Schumacher, Verstappen, Alonso, Raikkonen, none of them would have qualified in this thing. Such was the performance deficit, Vincenzo Sospiri and Riccardo Rosset were 11.603 and 12.717 seconds respectively off Villeneuve's pole time. Now it has to be said here that if you've seen Villeneuve's pole time for that race, it was a monster of a lap. He was nearly two seconds faster than his teammate in second place in the same car. But still, even if you took the times from Frentzen's time, who was about 3 tenths faster than Schumacher, they're still 9 and 10 seconds off the pace. This is Andrea Moda levels of slow, but not as slow as life. So, you know, every cloud and all that. Such was the speed of Villeneuve's pole lap, Pedro Diniz was also outside of the 107% cutoff point, but he was allowed to race, starting from the back of the grid, because the stewards saw that there were mitigating circumstances. Villeneuve was just way too quick basically. Damon Hill and Jos Verstappen only barely made it through and everything was just going to be a normal race but without the two Lola cars because they were just way too slow. I mean by 1997 standards I mean not even 40 were this bad so they were down on power, down on aero, down on luck and down on finances. Six million in the hole they ended up being, and that's because of the way Mastercard was conducting the sponsorship agreement. Now, I've only ever been handed a chunk of money to plug something in a video once in all the time I've done this. That was a Squarespace plug I did like two years ago, but after the whole copyright thing, I needed the money. But many of you would assume that when it comes to a sponsorship, a company or a person gives you an agreed amount of money in exchange for doing a thing. Whether it's a charity thing for children in need, or Comet Relief, or Make-A-Wish, as I did a couple of weeks ago. Or you're putting on something like, I don't know, some sort of expo and you need something to cover the fees. Whatever it may be. When it comes to racing, there might be other terms involved. The company will give you X amount now and will pay you Y amount based on your results or they can only pay you if you get a certain result. In racing, that's going to be a very complex and opaque thing, and we're never going to see the ins and outs of it, unless later down the line somebody says, yeah, this is how it works. Mastercard, in their infinite wisdom, although why Lola decided this was a good idea we'll never know, is that Mastercard had set up this kind of thing where it was basically like an F1 club for want of another name. The TLDR is, if you signed up to get a Mastercard credit card through the marketing for the Formula 1 team, Lola would get a kickback. Essentially, Lola had a 90s referral link. I've got a couple down in the description, you know, if you want to get car parts or F1 swag for Christmas, knock yourself out. But all plugs aside, this was not a sustainable way of financing a Formula 1 team. You could just imagine them back at the factory saying, look, we need to develop this new front wing. How many credit cards have we sold this week? It just wouldn't work. But because the performance of the team at Melbourne was so bad, Mastercard pulled all funding. The cars turned up to the Brazilian Grand Prix, but the blue, white, orange and red cars were there with no logos on them. Mastercard and all the other sponsors had run off and left them in the dry. 
The cars sat there doing nothing all weekend while Villeneuve went on to take the victory. If you cast your mind back, assuming you've watched it, to the video I did on the Jordan 191, I mentioned there that Eddie Jordan started out with $6 million and ended the season $6 million in debt. Lola was in that much debt after just one qualifying session. To add to this, the team was mentioned in the manual for the 1997 F1 game by Cygnosis, but was omitted from the actual game entirely. The team tested at Silverstone between Melbourne and Brazil, but the car was still rubbish. 10 seconds off the other teams that were there. The Lola car company went into receivership soon after and the assets were mopped up by Martin Baran, an Irish racing driver and businessman who had raced many Lolas in the past. While Baran wanted Lola back at Le Mans as that was his first love and where Lolas had typically shone in the past, his first job was to get everything fixed with the Americans and get Lolas back on the champ car circuit because Reynard had done to Lola what Lola had done to March. By 2002, a Lola had won the Champ Car World Series. Well, it was still cart at that point, but it was about to become the Champ Car World Series. It's the split. It's already confusing enough. But there was a small problem. Dallara was already the go-to supplier for the Indy Racing League. Well, IndyCar as it now was. With cart on the edge of bankruptcy and everything else going on, Lola wasn't in a happy place in terms of opportunities. Lola did go back to prototypes with a decent amount of success, but they were just about breaking even in the long run. They would get one last opportunity at financial success when IndyCar, now unified, opened the tenders for the 2012 onwards car. But after everything had been pitched, IndyCar chose, once again, the Dallara product. The IR05 would now become the DW12, which has evolved over the years into the IR18. It was at this point that Lola's 54-year existence came to an end. Autosport had the stats posted up. 181 kart races won, 5 Indy 500s, a USAC Triple Crown, a Daytona 24, 2 Formula Ford Festivals, and 11 LMP titles. But Lola was almost back on the Formula 1 grid very recently when Lawrence Stroll picked up the assets and everything else from the Force India team, which had collapsed. He tried to get the naming rights for the Lola name, but it all fell through, so he called it Racing Point instead. This is obviously morphed into the Aston Martin team. In the January of 2021, Motorsport Week did a list of the worst F1 teams in history, a list of 10 teams picked for their calamitous runs in Formula 1. Lola was third, behind only Andrea Moda and Life. In that same year, the Lola name was revived, and the new Lola aims to have a road car ready by 2025. But the collapse of Lola shows that you just can't rush a team into Formula 1 before it's ready. Nissan had the same issue with their LMP1 and the rest of the sport isn't going to wait around for you to catch up. Maybe Lola was just desperate for the MasterCard money and that's why it all went the way it did on the funding front. But at the end of it all, it just shows that motorsport is a mixed up, muddled up, shuck up world. Yeah, I made that same joke five years ago, what are you going to do about it? So then, a more updated look at the Lola team that failed so spectacularly in the 1997 Formula 1 season. If this has been a good updated video for you, or even mentioned stuff that you might not have known, then like the video so I know a good job was done. And for more like this, get subscribed with the bell on so you never miss out on any future content. Massive thanks to the kind folk at Patreon for the support, and if you want to contribute to the picture purchasing piggy bank, then a link to Patreon is in the description, along with links to Discord, socials, and my affiliate links. There's also memberships under this video, and there's super thanks there too, if you just want to do a one and done donation. So until next time, I've been Aidan Maud, have a great day wherever you are, and goodbye.